Hello, listeners. Hello. Uh, this is uh, our first episode. Uh, I'm Tyrell James, uh, otherwise known as Discourse Stew. And I am the bog witch that lives under your bed, Nicole, a.k.a. Kunsaragi, a.k.a. the local loudmouth. Anyways, hi, Stu. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you, Nicole? I am... I got to take home a giant-ass piece of pie, and my uh, boss gave me some edibles from work, so I'm about to roll up to Thanksgiving tomorrow, just on cloud nine. So that's how my Thanksgiving is going to go. Um, although, because you're you're cana- can- from Canada, I don't know, you guys have Thanksgiving, like, October or something, if at all? Uh, yes, yes, we have it in uh, we have it in uh, October. I always forget the exact date. It just kind of happens one day when I'm when someone's like, "Oh, we're doing Thanksgiving dinner." Yeah, see, I forgot because we were full disclosure. We were originally supposed to record Thursday, which is tomorrow, and then like three days ago, I was like, "Shit, that's Thanksgiving. I have to go to my step uncle's house, who is uh, recently divorced, a recovering alcoholic, and yeah, that's gonna be fun." Uh, at least I'm bringing edibles. Does, does he have a lot of? Does he have a lot of really great political opinions? He's going to tell you all. About? I have not asked. I don't want to ask. But once at my step grandfather's <laughs> funeral, he just like came up to me like and started crying on my shoulder, and I was like, "Okay, cool, cool. We are not this emotionally close whatsoever." But all right, so that's that's going to be fun. It's sad I'm not spending with my mom, so we could just like pass a joint back and forth but you know what that's next year i mean that that's that's what um that, that's what the holidays are for you, you you get drunk you get stoned you spend time with your family exactly exactly anyways Stu, what what movie are we what what, what are we doing here are we talking so this about is, a movie um, <laughs> or movies so this is this is a, a a podcast project um we're we're starting uh called uh, Marvelous or The Death of Film. Uh, and uh, we're taking a look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe and other fr- like mega franchises like it, just kind of the, the, the modern Hollywood blockbuster as it's emerged in the last 10, 15 years and the, and the kind of multimedia franchise landscape with the MCU is kind of the pillar of the biggest uh, central one. Yeah. And... Uh, well, you know, we're we're gonna. I mean, I I think it would be wildly hubristic to say we're gonna tear it down in any kind of literal sense, but we're certainly going to um, imp- impotently swing at it with our uh, pitchforks and torches. Yeah, um, and I guess this might be might as well get this out there a little early. I myself, I for a while I was actually pretty into the Marvel movies, mostly because um, around like the first year of college, the first Avengers came out. And I'm. I just saw pictures of Chris Evans in that suit, and I was like, "Holy shit!" So it was mostly a thirst watch for me, but I got really into it. Um, I never was like one of those like rabid people on Tumblr who had, you know, like role playing bot blogs, or one of those people who made like tony steve fan fiction like not one of those people but for a while up and like i saw endgame in theaters and i will admit i did cry let's get that out of the way right here throw your comments at me i don't care hell i even did half of my senior research project in college on uh agent carter that was how into sort of marvel i was for a while and just now a couple years down the line like i when I moved uh, this past summer, I actually gave away what Marvel movies I had acquired because I, I don't really, I don't, you could just, it just, they didn't seem very like worth holding like on Like you're going to watch them again? <laughs> yeah. I And just now that sort of, because like Endgame felt like really the fi- final thing, like it wrapped up everything, at least uh, in a way, when I saw it, I found satisfying and now it just seems like it's this mega franchise that's just like hauling around, you know, with their giant money bags, but just not like we're not even going to get into stuff like Eternals or Black Widow, but 
based on sort of what I've heard and critical reception, they're just like slogs that have kind of like it's kind of lost its charm, I guess, since sort of after Endgame. Like it doesn't seem like it has much purpose, but for a while I was really into Marvel. Um but yeah. I um Oh, sorry. Just uh, with with my history. So Iron Man, the first Iron Man comes out, same year as the Dark Knight, and I'm like 17. And I wasn't huge into comics. I wanted to be. It's just yeah. they cost money. And and this was before it was like reading comics. Like I read some comics on the computer, but it was like I was reading like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen on like a, a 640 by 480 CRT monitor. And that's a little rough. Mm. Um. So I didn't read a lot of comics because I couldn't afford them. It was hard to find where I lived. But I liked, you know, the cartoons as a kid. And I thought, oh, this stuff's fun. And I mean, like, it's – I think with a lot of these movies, with with a lot of modern blockbusters, to, to, to an extent probably always, but I think it's more so – it's really pronounced now. Yeah, yeah. Is they're, they're like they're like cotton candy. I like, – yeah. Like you, you, you enjoy them – in that first sugar rush, but they have no substance. Like J.J. Abrams movies, I've oh noticed they're all like this. Yeah, like like you watch them, like Mission Impossible, the Mission Impossible did Super Eight. Yeah, the first, uh, the, the Force Star Awakens, Wars. I really loved. Yeah, um, and the yeah. first time, and then you go back, and it it's brittle. It it it, it um it's like a it's like a disposable tool. You use it more than once, and it starts to fall apart very quickly. Yeah. Whereas I think a really good or great movie, or even just like a, a well crafted movie, e- even if repeated viewings will reveal its flaws, it'll also reveal virtues. There's an underlying structure that is still solid yeah. when you go back to it, and it'll reveal more than like Easter eggs too. But connected to like, oh well, this is a this is a callback to issue. 47 of the Hulk versus Thor or whatever, you know, not to mention like the sort of the biggest hurdling block to people like getting into comics and which was the reason I gravitated more. And I think a lot of people gravitate more towards like Marvel movies is there are just so fucking many comics there. You don't know where to start. Um, you know, you can, and they're always like rebooting them or whatever. Like, so it's, you don't know where to start. There's a lot of lore and stuff that gets interconnected. Um, so it's, it's a very daunting task and, if you want to be uh, like a, yeah. a Captain America completionist, you know? Um, and the, uh, the quality varies so much. Yeah. Like, you can't, Sit down and you're like, oh, I'm going to read Spider Man comics. It's like, there's like, well, there's issue 27 through 33 were really great. And then it sucked. And then, oh, um, uh, John Boner Haver comes in and he, he does this great nine issue run, but then Marvel kicked him off before he could yeah. finish his plot arc and he did a soft reboot. It's like, it, and I mean, I think the movies and TV shows are getting to that point because they're built. The like Marvel and DC did pioneer in comics this basic meta franchise. Oh, absolutely. Thing where where you've got this you, where you've got your comic universe where all the characters are interconnected, and then even when you want to do something that breaks away from that, it's a parallel universe, and you can open up a gateway to the parallel the, the meta fiction uh, cobweb. And I think as the and that stuff was huge in the seventies and eighties. I think when they really leaned into it. Yeah, is my sense, um, and then it started getting diminishing returns because it had all that baggage and inertia. And I think the movies and the shows and, and all the stuff now is going to start suffering the same problem um, in between th- that cumulative baggage and fatigue, and then a- as things go on and they get more desperate to bring in new talent and try new things to keep things fresh, you're going to get those sharper variances in quality too. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally agree. Because um, I am actually looking forward to rewatching like at least the first Captain America movie because I do have a lot of, and I'm not just saying this because I like, and I know I know Chris Evans is like a Hollywood lib; it can be cringe, but the man did freely post his dick pic online. Granted, it was by accident, but you know what? The Lord giveth. 
Um, and two, I have oh, is, to. Is Captain America rocking a super hog? Yes, yes. He, it was like a picture on his phone or something. He he posted like a screenshot of like his photo uh, library, and there was just one where it was just clearly his dick. Like, granted, it wasn't like brightly lit or anything. It was like a dick pic in the shadows. Um, and two, uh, he's from Sudbury, Mass, which is not far from where I grew up. So, and he also dated Jenny Slate, who is from my hometown. So big ups to her. Um, so I kind of got to support a local boy, even, even though he's like, what is he doing now that he's no longer Captain America? He's starting like some like conversations between right and people on the right and the left, like some sort of like political, like news site initiative or some shit oh god that it's, sucks yeah. so bad oh that's brutal. yeah i'm just like just just just, just stop talking and be hot please he's a he's a himbo he is that's, no he's know, a himbo he's shaped like a goddamn dorito but we're uh we're not <laughs> we're not here to, to be discussing either chris evans or captain america because we are going right back to where the fuck it all started which is iron man from 2008 directed by uh John Favreau, who directed Elf, and was also in a very, very special episode of The Sopranos. So, Stu, my first question- Oh, yeah, he was in, yeah. right, that meta Hollywood episode. Yeah. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, so, Stu, my first question to you is, do you think if Christopher Moltisanti had known John Favreau would be partly responsible for starting the biggest fucking movie franchise in the history of movies- do you think he would have turned his back on, you know, the on on the life and actually committed to writing that screenplay and getting it produced? Um I I don't know if he would be into the Marvels. I mean, I don't he's he's right on. He's like there's there's that type of guy that you think wouldn't like this stuff but then does yeah. just from their like left or from their childhood and they're just like they approach it at the most straightforward level. That's just like, "Oh, this is super cool." Or he might think it's super gay. I feel like that's like a straight 50/50. Come on, Tony. He's um, got an iron suit. Just yeah, I I, I would I think in retrospect this this movie would be greatly improved with uh a, a Chrissy appearance, but um, yeah, let's ha- have we ever has you know has there been any um uh Michael has Michael Imperioli been in any of these? I've, no, that not to feels know. like a thing that could happen. Not as a main character, no, but as like a scientist I, for a couple I scenes or something. Don't think so. Um, and I'm pretty sure because I I'm positive no. Because I have looked through at least his uh, profile on Letterbox just to see, because I, I kind of ended up watching a couple movies this past year that he was in. Um, just because I, full disclosure, I also just started watching The Sopranos like within the last 10 months. I'm oh, still so not, like I'm still not finished with it. I know what yeah. happens. I know, yeah, we, we all heard about The Many Saints, so... But uh, no, he has not been in any Marvel or Marvel, at least not in any MCU stuff. Um, I'd have to double check to see if he was in any like lesser one Marvel of the sh- movies. I feel like if he was, if he is, it's one of the Netflix shows or something. That yeah, would be like- may- yeah, maybe then again, because that. Actually, so, I mean, you've got yeah. D'Onofrio in there. Like, like if um, if uh, Gandolfini was still alive, God rest his soul. Yeah. I feel like they would have tried to get him. I don't know if he would have done it, but I feel like they would have tried to get him in one of those because that's like that feels like right on the mark yeah. they, they aim for with that stuff. Um. Okay, I'm searching Michael Imperioli, uh, Marvel, and nothing, nothing is coming up. Thank God. Um. Just, just that, just that he is. Oh, oh, that apparently at some point. I'm seeing a article that fan casting people really wanted Michael Imperioli as Rocket Raccoon for Guardians of the Galaxy. You know what? If you that that rips that rips. If if you yeah if you like if you think if you don't think about um what's his name already doing it Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. That another guy. local boy. I can see it. Like I can see oh, that yeah. kind of um kind of mix of like goofball and and angry guy yeah he should he needs to be um, in more stuff although i think he was he was just in 
one night in Miami. He, he was he was on he was on Lucifer. I I, I don't watch yeah. that show. I just see it on in the background, like my mom, my sister are watching it or something. And I saw him coming up on there a bunch for a while. So uh, he's getting work at least. That's that's good. Um, and again, he had that major voiceover role for Many Saints in New York. So still collecting the Sopranos paycheck. Gotta respect that. Oh, somebody's got to. Um, so Iron Man. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to attempt, unless you want to, I'm going to attempt just to very briefly summarize. I assume everybody's seen it. They know the deal. Yeah. Um, with most of these. So I'm just going to very, very briefly summarize the plot uh, so we can kind of get past it and just kind of free range sure. over it. Yeah. And I made like um, about three and a half pages of notes in my little, my little like reviewers. Notebook. That's as well. That's about how many pages I made okay. in a in a in a, a text document. Okay, I wonder how many of our observations rolled up, or yeah, because I I got some good. Yeah, does not did not hold up. I was like originally would have put this at like a four out of five, just because I remembered like seeing it. You know, the first time, of course. I don't remember when I first saw it, but, you know, it would play a lot on, like, FX, for example. And it was – you know what? It's still – Robert Downey Jr. is still really great in the role, and it's a relatively well-made popcorn movie. But, oh, Jesus Christ, have the politics aged, like, sour milk. That'll be – I've, I've – that's my whole – my whole take on the movie. Oh, yeah. Those are my big – I've – I've got one, but first, so so plot summary: uh, Tony Stark, uh, billionaire dickhead. He's an arms dealer, but he's played like a like a tech lord, or, uh, like a Howard uh, Hughes, Chad, or dare I say, a I, Elon Musk. No, they they. Um, I read in there, uh, Favreau and RDJ. Is that douchey to say that? It's just RDJ. short and it's convenient, but it also makes make, I feel like a dickhead saying it out loud. Now I realize RDJ, the notorious RDJ, D Junes, RD Junes. Anyway, they took a tour of SpaceX yes. with him, and it must have been early because this is like two thousand. Well, the movie's in pre production. Um, so like I think that they're like he's supposed to be, he's like the ultimate version of that type of guy who's got like all the the real genius and panache and and super confidence that these guys pretend to have yeah. or wish they had um when really like the, the real life guys like this what they do is they they have a bunch of wouldn't it be cool if sci-fi ideas and then they 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 scream at engineers until the engineers either make it work or at least make it look like you can pretend yeah. it works. Or or they tweet about how the guy running a rescue operation is a pedophile, in which case you are Elon that Musk. That was so funny. <laughs> Remember that? God damn. That was hysterical. God, he's such His a tool. Fucking, that um, boat wouldn't, that fucking submarine wouldn't have worked either. It would have probably killed... Like they would have had to take like a child out like once every four hours or some shit. So stupid. I just, it's like those like you ever watch like an like a seventies or eighties sci fi movie and there's things that are like futuristic props just because it's the future. Yeah. So there's like a future coffin. Yeah, yeah. That, he made a future co- He made a he made a future coffin <laughs> from like a, a, a low to mid budget eighties sci fi. Yeah, movie. basically. Um, and Grimes was so, like, that's so cool. That's my Grimes impression. I, it's hard to do an impression of her because I feel like you really got to get in that like yeah. th- that I, upper register, uh, like that, like that shit. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't do no, it. No, I don't want to. I don't um, want to break our. What few listeners who are listening now, I don't want to break. Uh, have them sent away because I'm giving out a frequency only dogs can hear. Getting sued because someone put this on their. Uh, on their speakers and shattered glass. <laughs> um, it's Havana syndrome. So, okay. <laughs> Plot summary. Uh, Tony Stark, billionaire dickhead, tech lord arms dealer, uh, demonstrating a super missile in Afghanistan, uh, pan-Eurasianly diverse, completely apolitical terrorists, quote unquote, kidnap him, 
to make him make the missile because again, he's, he's a singular genius who can build this missile. It's not just like a team of engineers making this stuff and you could just steal their blueprints um, with a USB thumb drive and an email that says uh, click here for boner pills. Um, He makes uh, an Iron Man suit. He fights his way out. He makes a better Iron Man suit. He has a, a moral revelation about how bad it is to sell arms because his company is selling them to terrorists who use them to kill American soldiers. Cause, cause that's really the problem. Not that we're uh, bombing Afghan villages, but that our weapons are yeah. falling into the wrong hands. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not the, Amer- it's not the U S air force with the billion dollar weapons doing the horrible crimes. It's, it's these, these, these not Taliban guys. Um, the 10, the 10 then, rings oh, as they call themselves, which, and, and, this was this would have been this was oh eight or at least filmed in two thousand seven. So this was pre ISIS, mind you, listeners. I'm I'm just gonna address it, yeah address people I, as listeners. I assume Ten Rings is like a throwaway reference to some. It's it's, super it's villain definitely group or it's from the definitely comics. something from like the Marvel comics. I feel. Um, I don't know. It's I don't know. It's probably not like not as big as like Hydra. For example, but I I think um, and watch me be completely wrong about this, but I'm you know what I I would bet fifty dollars that Ten Rings is something from the comics. Yeah, fifty dollars. Um, because that I mean that's how all of this stuff like video game adaptations are really bad for this. They just they have a generic plot and then they just label things or dress them up with those familiar elements. Yeah. But preserve just the block blockbuster movie yeah. formulas. Just point at um, your screen like Leonardo DiCaprio in his lazy boy chair. Look, it's a Yeah, just for uh, on loop forever. I mean, they've they, we, we're we're to the point now where we can get nostalgic about people making fun of nostalgia. Like how long ago was the Remember Berries or whatever it was from South Park? Oh my god. How long ago? <sighs> Well, that, that's so sad because I've seen promos for the new South Park season. It's just all about COVID. And that just seems fucking miserable. I, I have not. I've seen like two episodes of South Park since, well, since this movie came out, really. Um. Damn. Um, and actually, while we're still early on in sort of the synopsis, something I want to point out, because I, I did my own little research. Um, so the the movie opens in what... There's a little little text that pops up, you know, to give you the location. Clay, uh, Tony Stark's uh, like military uh, brigade. All the trucks are coming through, driving him, you know, back from showing off the uh, the Jericho weapon that he yeah. had developed. The text says, "Oh, this is Kumar Pro- Kunar Province." No, it's not. It's not. It's not Kunar Province. Um, and let me just read briefly. Um, an excerpt from this paper that I found, hold on, called uh, Iron Man, A Case Study in Orientalism and Hegemony by Aidan Bryant. Um, uh, So Bryant writes, the first criticism that can be drawn from Iron Man, not three seconds into the beginning of the film, is with regard to the setting. The opening in much of the first third of the film takes place in the Kunar province of Afghanistan, which is presented as a mountainous region that is, for lack of better categorization, a desert. In reality, the Kunar province of Afghanistan is actually quite green. It is rocky and mountainous, but it is not the harsh, dusty landscape landscapes that the film portrays. This raises the question of why it was, quote-unquote, necessary to portray Afghanistan in such a factually incorrect way way. Is this a result of a lack of research? Would American audiences not believe that there are actually trees in the Middle East? Uh, so yeah, I'll just right off the bat, a inaccurate depiction of a region that we literally within the last, what has it been now? Like, at least six 20, months. 20 years, pretty much. On that the we dot. just oh, pulled oh, out of. But yeah, a, a region that by that point in presumably 2007, we had been in for over like a little over half of a decade. And we can't even like just, yeah, strike one movie. Um, oh, I mean, that's definitely like 
they had a location scout. They found a location they thought looked pretty and and like that mix of arid and mountains you think of when you think of Afghanistan stereotypically. And then it was like an intern late in the editing process was just like, well, we need one of those Tom Clancy movie little uh, sci-fi military title cards yeah. uh, to say this is somewhere in Afghanistan. And they, they just had a guy like go, I don't know, what's in yeah. Afghanistan? Kunar province? Sounds yeah. Good. So what Bryant pulls from this, um, if I, uh, let me just continue, is um, sort of trying to gauge at sort of what this you know, is this a mistake or is this a deliberate fictionalization of a real location? Um, So Bryant observes that first, it reinforces American preconceptions of Middle Eastern geography, perhaps to enable more comfortably consumption for audiences. Secondly, it emphasizes the inherent danger in the setting by making the region uninhabitable, even the plants. Finally, it draws a parallel between the physical features of the land and the character of the people who live there, emphasizing the brutal, barbaric nature of the Afghan villages. It emphasizes the quote-unquote other, um, and other being used in the sense of Edward Said. Um, the, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, the capital O. Yeah, the capital O, other. Um, it emphasizes the other by making the Kunar province vastly separated from the rich, densely populated, and advanced infrastructure of America. So this, I, I know this might seem like if if you're you know a Marvel fan or you know Marvel, um, I don't want to say apologist, but just <laughs> I guess just you know this this like you you'd probably want to be like oh it's just you know to give it a better sort of visual atmosphere, but again like. This is in, you see, like, you look at this Afghan village in contrast to all the scenes that take place, like, um, I believe, yeah, Tony Stark's house it's, is in, like, LA or at least California. Because I did it's, read, it's I read something about Favreau, Favreau not wanting this movie to be set in New York because he felt that there was already just, like, too many superhero movies set in New York. Like, you got, you already got your fucking Spider-Man Run around. I think Fantastic Four took place in New York. I don't know. Oh yeah, they. I mean, like like all Marvel superheroes are in New York. Yeah, Daredevil, so, like it's because that's where they were located. That's where all the writers and artists yeah. lived. Um, I think it, there's something here too, which is like the West Coast, like Southern California, um, to an extent, Washington State was huge for like mid century. Uh, military aircraft and aircraft manufacturing generally. That's a good point. And it still it still is um, too. But like, because uh, I'll just finish the synopsis here really yeah. quick. Um, he muddles around, kills some terrorists who are using his weapons to terrorize people for no reason. Finds out that um, Jeff Bridges is actually the real bad guy all along, and then they have a big stupid robot fight. Uh, he, he learns yeah. his lesson. He's a better person. The end. Um, there is because I'm I'm a little bit of I'm a dilettante in all things, but I'm a little bit of 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 a, a military aircraft uh, nerd. Oh, those um, are, so those are your trains you're telling me. A, a, li- a little bit, and they are all over this movie. Like yeah. we get a lot of. I mean, we've got shots of Air Force bases, obviously, and and I think like an air uh, like an air museum kind of set. Rhodey's in there somewhere. And there's also Air Force captain. Um, yeah. Which, oh God. But like, Terrence also, Howard like, is was not was. He's not good. He's in not this. good. I, no wonder. So I. I yeah. Could, I could. Don Cheadle was was a was a big upgrade. Um, one of the establishing shots of like the Stark Industries, uh, like office and complex, is like a panning shot of a statue of a, a YF twenty three, which was yeah. a, an experimental jet that was competing with the F twenty two and mm-hmm. didn't enter pro- uh, mass production. Which was like Boeing, so it like it's basically it's like, it's like it's basically almost establishing that Stark Industries is canonically Boeing. Um, all over his um, like his his shop, like you can see models of uh, experimental and mass produced military aircraft, like lining the walls. Yeah. Um, the 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 final scene of the movie, the second final scene, I guess, if you count him as scenes before he does his goes out and says, "I am yeah. Iron Man." The movie ends. Is is him and Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, debriefing with with Coulson, the the Shield guy. Yeah, they're in that like back and, office, and there's yeah, and all the 
pictures on the wall are these giant pictures of World War II era. Yes. Uh, yes. Weapons manufacturing, arsenal for democracy. Yes, big, it's cute. It's um, huge big in the background assemb- too. Like I paused, I yeah, paused stock- the video, too, to just look at it because I was. It's you know, it's just it's like there's one shot where it's just like in the middle of them, basically. Yeah, and it's and it's famous, like like relatively famous, like stock well stock photo historical photos of like assembly lines producing B seventeen and B twenty nine heavy bombers. Um, which were like the B twenty nine in particular, but that's just like the the next step up from the B seventeen. It's basically the same thing. Is like like these were the weapons. These were not tactical military weapons. These these weapons with at best disputable military efficacy were the weapons that like laid waste to Dresden, yeah, and Tokyo, and and then drop it with firebombs and drop the atomic bombs and. Them and their successors would go on to flatten North Korea and Vietnam and Laos, uh, Laos and Cambodia, um, and I th- I think so. I, I guess I'll just uh, jump in with it here, since since it's come up. Yeah. Uh, my read on this movie, going back to it, was it's the end of the Bush administration. Uh, Obama is about to be elected, although not necessarily anybody knows that. Um, and I think kind of liberal uh, Hollywood, the the liberal part of the bourgeoisie and the upper middle class that kind of influences culture at this level is looking for uh, like a redemption arc. Tony Stark is America. He's, he's the empire. He's cool and awesome and a genius and rich and powerful, but he's been irresponsible and in a way duped by like his evil counterpart, um, Obadiah you know, Stane, so, Jeff, yeah, Jeff Bridges. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Bridges. Because it's always like the evil is always this like isolated, intrusive element that you can remove. It's it's not truly in, intrinsic. Um, and this is li- like a liberal America's redemption story where, where it, it, it faces it in a way that limits its accountability to like an oopsie, like – you know, like he, yeah. he he's in that cave in Afghanistan. There's that doctor who is Yinsen, just who I committed would like to, the to death talk about to saving too. his life. Yeah. Um so so it's like America, liberal America confronts the horror of empire, yes. resolves to capital D, capital B, do better, yeah, and is strengthened morally and as a personality by confronting with the atrocities it's wrought, which makes it only more equipped and more righteous to have a monopoly on force, which is what yes. the Iron Man suit represents, yes. this this singular power of empire. Yes. Um yeah, I wrote I wrote like you know, just because I whenever I watch movies, I kinda like to write as I go, just whatever sort of stupid thought pops into my head or stupid observation. Sort of gauging at what the message of this movie is it's not, you know, it's not don't build weapons to drop on Afghan villagers or innocent people. It's don't build weapons because they can fall into the wrong hands. Or yeah, it's yeah. it's keep your weapons to yourself. More accountability only you can use them. More accountability, please. Um, yeah, that's that's the and that's the. Um, like that's given away at one point. Tony Stark, um, when he's confronted, um, I'm not sure if whether it's by um, Obadiah Stane or someone else, but he says, and I wrote this down: I saw young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend and protect that's, them. That is him, young yeah. Americans. Not not the 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 villages and cities that and weddings that have been massacred by. J dams dropped from F sixteens and F eighteens and 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 all that. No, it's these bad guys got their hands on yeah, them because the, the bad guy in the, the company bad Arabs. sold them. It's the bad Arabs, um, and just well, well yeah. they're technically not Arabs. They're they're they make a point of being like, oh, they're from all over Eurasia. Some of them speak Hungarian. Yeah. some of them speak Urdu, and like it's it's like how how like really reactionary like revenge movies always have multi-ethnic gangs yeah yeah um i haven't seen it but like that's the vibe i get from like death wish three um which that's that oh yeah every every death wish uh i've only seen the first one actually but i think they're all like that Um, yeah 
Um, but since I did bring it up, I do want to talk briefly about the character of Yinsen because, and this yes. is something I had completely forgot because this is the guy who is responsible for saving Tony Stark's life and putting in that, you know, little, the thing that prevents the, you know, shrapnel from penetrating his heart that he would, you know, go on to use to put the, you know, mini, um, sh shoot, what is it called? The... Arc, the reactor arc reactor to you, that would basically power the Iron Man suit. This guy Yinsen is basically responsible for bringing Tony to what he becomes. He's kind of given sort of, um, and I don't know how recently you've seen like the first Captain America, but uh, the character not, not since it came out. The really. um, oh, oh, what's that actor's name? Um, it's the uh, the Jewish doctor who recruits Steve Rogers into the program in the first place, and he's you know shot by a Hydra agent after you know he has the transformation. And that character is constantly giving callbacks throughout the movies. That's and yet this character Yinsen, as far as I'm aware, has never been mentioned beyond this movie. Um, and again, no, this and is he this is a character that has, in my opinion, like. A really, really important role that he plays. Even granted, even though he's only in like the first forty minutes, and you know he's he's killed, but he's he's a like character 20. that should have been afforded more weight. Um, and they make a point like so. Yinsen is a uh, doctor. He's uh, apparently from um, the village that Tony later goes into in the full Iron Man suit to like, you know, quote unquote, protect the villagers and, you know, really just yeah. bomb the shit out of the 10 rings guys to, to exercise his right to protect. But Yinsen um, is a doctor who was, you know, captured by the 10 rings. Uh, he mentions that, you know, he really misses his family and, you know, he, he's looking forward to see them soon. And of course with his dying breaths, he's like, Oh no, my whole family's dead. Um, which, is just gives you a little yeah, he, glimpse he's... into this character that could really have been used a better and b you know like you you see a little glimpse of like oh could they be going for trying to like you know make a statement on you know the experience of like civilians and how that no no they just the character just dies and as far as i'm aware he's never mentioned Again, like there's not even like Tony Stark no, doesn't he, do like sense. Oh, you know, well that Yinsen guy, he protected me, and like no, as as far as yeah, I'm that, aware, that's the thing. Like for for the part of the movie he's in, they like they like stop. It's like oh yeah, his his family was killed by the bombing of his village, and they leave ambiguous whether it's terrorists or the U.S. Air Force that did that bombing. Um, I honestly don't know what you're supposed to take away from that that way. And he's like, but it's like weird because he's like weirdly committed to keeping Tony Stark alive. Like he's got a death wish because his family is dead, yeah. and that I can I can understand. But he's like I, I I don't know if it's supposed to be like a scientist respects a scientist thing he, or something. He, but it's yeah, like he does at um Yinsen, I believe he says to Tony Stark at one point. Um, so you're a man who has everything and nothing. Um, you know the the gist of yeah, that cause, being because Tony Stark doesn't have a family. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have sort of a ground something that grounds him. In a way, like, again, like, usually, like, a family or he has no sort of moral direction is sort of the gist of what I get from that line. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, this is a man who has literally lost everything, presumably either from, like, uh, an attack by the Ten Rings, who, again, are being funded by Stark Industries and supplied weapons. So... Either either way, whether or not this his like um in the name of the village, I have this written down, but I don't want to waste time going through my notes. Um, but whether or not Yinsen's village or where he was from was bombed by like us, the Americans, or whether that was you know uh, collateral damage from like local infighting. That we, again, as an occupational and invading force, created the circumstances to, like, just, I think anyone with half a brain should really be able to pick up on, or just be able to sort of see through 
that sort of um, use of this character as trying to, you know, give a like a human face to the like what is being wrought it's, in Afghanistan. Um, well, yeah. it's, that's the thing. It's it's the redemption. It's oh, you, you see the footage of Afghanistan on the news and you think, oh, we we did a boo boo. That's bad. And and realizing that's bad has only made us better and 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 more equipped to rule the world because no one else can bear that responsibility like us because we're special. Like yeah. it's um the, the, the capital L American liberal wants to see all the bad things America does and and is like, oh, these are bad and I want to do something about them in the abstract, but doesn't want to let go of empire, of, of American exceptionalism, of, of all that. It can't look at like the underlying thing that makes it work. So you end up with this with the fetish for acknowledgement, yes, that's a very and good recognition term. and apology because it's all because you can't because you can't conceive of the problem because if you if you conceive of the problem at a structural level like at the level of a movie you can't if you really confront what the stuff they're gesturing at means the arms industry and everything in any meaningful way you can't actually make an Iron Man movie exactly you, you can't have him take on this this power and everything you just have to kind of paper over the hypocrisy or else you can't make the movie at all um and that's a microcosm of the larger problem of american so-called progressive liberals being unable to deal with the problems of the american empire yeah and 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 how they how they cope with the cognitive yes. dissonance and uh, there are like paltry attempts at least early on to sort of try to like it's soft, soft criticism as I would take it. Like the uh, the head, uh, the lead guy of the uh, Ten Rings, not the not the, the hulking one with the um, really offensive like hook nose, but the 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 kind of uh, uh, roly poly guy with the big beard. He he says, um, you know, you know, welcome Tony Stark, the most famous mass murderer in the history of America, and he's right. But again, this is yeah. like. It's it's throwaway lines like that that end up getting buried underneath like the rest of this movie that again you're supposed to be rooting for Tony Stark and for to Favreau and Marvel's credit again the casting of Robert Downey Jr is like the thing that holds this movie together he his it, charisma it really is, like- is so like disarming that like even I you know, and I I still relatively enjoyed watching this movie. It was, you know, I started kind of checking out within the last, like, 15 minutes. Because, again, it's, you know, that the big criticism of a lot of Marvel movies is, like, the climactic end fight is, like, the superhero versus a big, darker version of the superhero. And it's that's literally that. Like, yeah. Jeff Bridges gets into a big, dumb uh, Iron Man gorilla it's, suit, basically. It's so... Cause, cause, like his, like Jeff Bridges, he's he's a shady business guy. Yeah, he's and shady yeah. business guys don't do their own dirty work. They don't. Well, he, climb he recruits. In the mech he suits. does. He does have a conversation where he tries to recruit, like a he recruits like a bunch of, um, not I don't think they're Stark scientists. I think he just makes like a general like he makes a phone call that's like you know get me the top people, which leads to what I think is the best line in the movie. Um, I don't and I don't know. I don't know how many takes I did of uh, uh, Jeff Bridges going, Tony Stark made this in a cave with a box of scraps. (laughs) Which, oh my, why does he say it like that? Well, I think they're trying to, because that's how, that's what all these movies do now. Not just Marvel movies, but like this type of blockbuster is... We know that this is really silly, so we're gonna put a big old lampshade on it, so you can we can wink yeah. and nod at each other, and then we can all go. And it's like it doesn't make sense that like a team of scientists can't build a thing, they and can't then make the arc a guy in a cave enough. can, no matter how much of a genius he is. Yeah, and um, I will say because I know a lot of people sort of like to, um, and and by that I mean not without reason. Um, you know, term sort of the sort of kind of snappy, quick, very meta dialogue that a lot of Marvel movies have become in, co- in like have really become yeah the the, the, the Whedon speak Whedon, but yeah. this is before Whedon 
you know, this Whedon became involved with he he directed the Avengers and the second Avengers. So this is before even his involvement. And what you would I would call it sort of Whedon esque speak, but apparently, um, again, doing some research on the uh, pre production. Most of the dialogue was all improvised and improv. Um, so they only really yeah, had like, yeah. they only really had scripted like the action sequences, the sort of stuff, you know, that you make and you render in like 3D, like before you actually, you know, sit your actors yeah, down. Yeah, they, they had the structure in place, but a lot of the specifics yeah. of the scenes weren't. They had Shane Black of Lethal Weapon and then Iron Man 3, like on the phone giving them dialogue okay. as an, an unofficial writer. And this movie is credited with four writers. Yeah. And they're they're improvising and calling Shane Black on the phone, but but um I it's, not that's how it goes. Not totally noxious in my opinion. There are um again Terrence Howard is just completely out of place. Like he was not He he's he's a flat he's so fl- uh I wrote when he first appears on screen, I wrote in my notes, why is Terrence Howard's voice so high? He keep he looks like he should be like he should be like directing like a cabana band or something like a like a, a <laughs> looks like <laughs> Lou Bega or something like <laughs> fucking Mumbo Number Five. I just he does not read. He's just he's just wrong. Um, and I don't know. Did he like decline to come back for Iron Man Two or was? He just like so They're, shitty to work he, with that they were like, "All right, we're going with our second pick," which was you know Don I, Cheadle. I think it's of, that he yeah. was. He was. I, if I remember, I didn't look back into this. I remember when Iron Man Two came out. There's a bit of controversy over recasting him, and it was. Be, I think the sense I got was he is a hard to work with. He's a really weird guy. Um, yeah, didn't he say some? Also, weird apparently, shit has an about- un, unusually small dick. Wait, excuse me. About this. Wait, something about him just having like because we well, I mean, because we brought it up because you brought up uh, Chris uh, Evans, like uh, Terrence Howard. Here's um, how my ex wife extorted me over my penis from TMC. Yes, that's it was it was relevant somehow. Like it became what like a the thing. Fuck? Oh my god. Okay. It's, well, that's yeah. I remember like I forget the details, but he was like a really weird difficult guy and he's the performance he's giving in this movie i don't know if he's good in other stuff but uh the performance he's giving in this movie is not like there, there wasn't any reason to, to keep him on no I don't think. he um, yeah his his recast don Cheadle, and i'm i'm not a Cheadle head um and i i quite hated him in uh space jam 2 although there's i, I hated everything about space jam 2 that movie should yeah. be destroyed um, I and I wish well, I had they, that they, movie they was two hours, the, the, over two hours they long. What the, the uh, fuck? The cardinal sin of uh, uh, heresy against one of your favorite movies. Oh yeah. Oh, don't even get me started. This is this is not a Ken Russell podcast. But yeah, his. I, I was thinking for like bonus episodes or something, we can just talk about whatever movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I already have sort of the idea of what, when we get to that eventually, sort of like what you should watch instead or what sort of connects to it. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep going where we are. Um, cause hold on, let's see. What else did I, uh, what else? Uh, also the oh, fact sure, that Rhodey, at least, at least it's more apparent in this movie than like the subsequent one. Um, Rhodey, which is, uh, who will become War Machine. That's uh, the character Terrence Howard's playing. Uh, he's a real war hawk. Um, so I don't think in the original comics he was a air captain or something. Or like I don't think he worked for the Air Force in the original comics. I think that was purely a thing, an invention of this movie. Um, but he he comes off as real war hawkish to me. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, also, Marvel, stop, stop trying to make Air Force recruitment happen. It's, it's not going to happen. Come on, like more like the Chair Force. The cha- more like the Chair Force. That's. I think I, 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 I know a guy who was in the Navy, and that's like all the branches have their antagonistic terms for each other. Um. Actually, you know, you have to be a small guy to be at least a pilot. Like you, like those fighter jets, like 
like you can't fit in them if you're over like five eight or five ten or something. Oh my god, really? It's uh, oh, is that is that why yeah, yeah, is that pure, why it's, uh, Tom Cruise Top Gun exists? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, he's the only kind of guy that can fit he's in like those. It's five it's, uh, three the, or the something. Air Force is. He's a like, yeah. The Air yeah. Force is is all for short kings. Short, the short king force. Yeah. Um. Okay. Where. Uh. Oh well, we also have uh, kind of rounding out the cast. We haven't quite talked about uh, uh, Gwyneth Goop Paltrow as Pepper Potts. Yeah. Who I think is great in this. I never. I'm not a fan of her broadly. I think she's great in this. I honestly, I think she's she's yeah. she's, she's pretty good in these movies. She. You know, she gives a good. Um, you know, I'm and she, I'm not. She's a got Paltrow actual head. chemistry with uh, Downey Jr. Like, yeah, oh, they have they have they, absolute they chemistry. Well like, there's there's that that scene at you know the uh, uh, benefit. Which did you catch where that uh, the Tony Stark's benefit for the firefighters takes place at? Did you catch that Disney concert I think hall? I, you're right. Yeah, I Disney I did concert catch that, hall. And I forgot about it. But then you remember, um, which was before Disney bought because this was distributed yes, by Paramount. This was distributed by Paramount. In um, another thing from reading about the pre-production, uh, this was completely funded by Marvel itself, um, and which which is, is which a is huge gamble. They spent 140 million. But here's million on the thing: this. Favreau and at least a bunch of, or at least a handful of people um, involved with the production were like. During like interviews, we're like, yeah, we this was basically like an indie movie, which just no, no, this was what well, was they, the budget of this? This was like over a hundred yeah, million dollars. But they they shot it like one because there was so much improvisation that's, on set. That, that does not of uh, indie this hundred and forty million dollars. <laughs> I think that's that is what not means, an independent I movie. Guess. No, stop it, John Favreau. Just you know what was an independent movie? I think uh, Chef, Chef. But what what was Chef's movie budget? Eleven million. That's an independent movie, or at least an independent movie budget, not a hundred and forty fucking million dollars. Just just because you weren't. Have, have yeah. you ever seen Swingers? No. I, that, that I think would be it. Count as I've never seen it either, but I just know that's like that's where John Favreau. Wait, no, he didn't and, do uh, Swingers. He. Yeah, Swingers. That was yeah, no. he was in it and he directed he it. He wrote think, it. Right? He Am wrote it. Uh it was directed by Doug Lyman. Uh the guy who oh, did Doug yeah, Lyman. the guy who did Edge of Tomorrow. The Underworld guy? Yeah. No. Uh, no, uh, no he did Edge the... of Tomorrow, uh Born Identity, uh Jumper. Right. Who Um no you're right, I think you right, might be thinking right. of um John Favreau's first movie, which was called Made, which I think is the movie that like they kind of parodied that he was making in that episode of The Sopranos. Um, oh, I was well. I was thinking of I confused Doug Lyman with Len Wiseman. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, like uh, Edge of actually, you know, Edge Edge of Tomorrow, surprisingly great film. I've I've heard a lot of good things actually, about I think it. That one's I think that one's really I think that I mean maybe if I rewatched I'd soften on it. But I've seen it a couple times. Pretty great. Uh, I always think Tom Cruise is at his best when he's like kind of a, a smarmy dickhead. Yeah. Oh, damn. You. So Len Wiseman. Uh, for those of you not in the know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Len Wiseman is the director of Underworld. Underworld Evolution. Uh, not Underworld Lies of the Lichens. He did produce that though. Not Underworld yeah. Awakening. Oh no, he he directed the Total Recall remake. P U. Which is. Terrible. I haven't yeah. seen it, but P.U. Look at it, look at the, I'm looking at. I've never seen a picture of him before, but his his like profile picture on. Oh, he looks. Is, like, wait, really hold on. Like... I'm gonna send you. <laughs> hold on. I'm gonna put a picture of him in the chat because this guy, this guy looks like an absolute Chad. Oh man, yeah. I mean, you can. I mean, he was married to Kate Beckinsale for a long oh, time. Oh, okay. He he pulled the he pulled the he he did the Paul W S Anderson mm-hmm. you you put your wife in a bunch of like mid budget schlock action movies. Oh, uh, they divorced in twenty nineteen though. Oh, well, she's back on the market. Yeah. Eh? Oh, okay. Will she, will she wear the suit? Will she wear the all leather <laughs> suit, cat suit? <laughs> okay. Um, back to Iron Man. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, oh yeah. Also, I totally forgot. Very early appearance. Um. Uh, Agent Coulson, who is is best known, he gets 
killed off in the Avengers. He's the S.H.I.E.L.D. He, agent who, you know, starts going up to ha- yeah. hassling Tony and Pepper um, about, like, you know, we need to debrief you over, you know, how you escaped from Afghanistan. Um, and then he got his own spinoff on TV, even though I think he was dead. Yeah, he was. I don't get he was, it. Well, he's the I remember in Avengers, they like imply he maybe faked his death to like bring the team together. Okay, that 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 tracks. or something. And I never watched the show. I never saw how they explain if he faked his death or came back to life or something cuz you know it's comic book yeah. stuff. It's death means nothing. Um what was this is an old like proverb I heard somewhere. It was uh the o- the only person in comics who stays dead is Uncle Ben. Yeah, that's very true. Or and Yinsen. Yinsen stays fucking dead. They don't and even Yinsen. mention him <laughs> at all. Um, oh yeah, and of course we get our uh, Stan Lee cameo during that uh, benefit for the firefighters. He he shows up as Hugh Hefner. Yeah, which uh, I, I mean I don't know he um <laughs> he's a, a bit of a whore. So that oh, makes he sense. was absolutely getting it in like until they like you know he up until probably a week before he died he was probably getting it in. Oh yeah, I think I I meant more more broadly like the way he. He treated his uh, co-creators and and stuff. Oh boy! Okay, <laughs> famously, yeah, um, taking all taking all the credit uh, and money and leaving guys like Jack Kirby, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of out in the cold. Yeah. Um. So that basically kind of rounds out. Oh yeah, and of course, uh, the most consequential, uh, the first of the Marvel ending like end end scenes, we get. Samuel L. Motherfucking Jackson as Nick Fury, who shows up to proposition Tony Stark about the Avengers Initiative. Dun dun dun. Which, which apparently they kind of just threw yeah. together on a lark. There was, there was no like phase one is something they kind of retconned in once they were a few movies in. Were like, okay, we can we can pull together an Avengers movie, and, and, and Disney had bought them. And yeah, everything. I guess, and I read um, somewhere that they had recorded like an alternate um version of that ending scene where it's just i guess samuel L. jackson on the phone talked about like iron man now i gotta deal with alien invaders uh guys with hammers uh giant green guys like just, you know na- like you know naming out various marvel heroes but at that point they didn't have um the rights i guess or at least the rights to make a movie about certain characters, like obviously Marvel, um, like they didn't get the rights to like yeah, Spider Man they... or at least the Marvel Studios to or Disney at least until like you know the uh, Spider Man Homecoming came out. Um, so and I I think I think they only had uh, Iron Man and like Hulk were like their major two ones, which was why they were the first two. Even though there was yeah, there was Hulk, that Ang Lee Hulk, Hulk was... movie like set like three or four years before. The um, Edward Norton yeah, and, one, and no, no, the the Ang or no, or I'm not sure which we get yeah, because Edward Norton was in the one they because that came out this same year at the end I, of the year. I think so. They must I, have been in production yeah. about the same time. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. And um, that you know that's funny. That one will be because I assume we'll do that one next, or maybe we'll do the Dark Knight because I feel like that's also just salient to the broader. Phenomenon, yeah, and that that the Dark Knight is kind of regarded as like the the cream of the crop in terms of like uh, people regard it as like a just a good like you know entertaining popcorn movie and be like a movie that is actually like good in and of itself. Like you know, of course, yeah. I, I haven't seen it in a long ass time, so I'd be interested in rewatching it. I'm just, I'm curious, yeah. yeah. Because we all loved it when it came oh, out. Oh, yeah. And, like, I still, like, um, I, I feel like Heath Ledger's role would still kind of send chills down my spine just just because, like, that, you know, his death was so tragic. And that was, like, his final big film. It was, like, he won an Oscar posthumously. Um, like, I remember his you, family uh, going you, up and accepting. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like that would still be, have an effect on me. But I would be I was interested say, if you in- if you omit that one that uh, – Terry Gilliam movie. He was he died partly. Oh production. yeah, the, what was it called? Was it the oh the uh, Imaginarium Doctor Parnassus? I the, think the Imaginarium of Doctor Parnassus, yes. which is 
a very strange film, even for Terry Gilliam. It's a, that was an odd one. Um, But yeah, no, I, yeah. And I'm also, it it kind of, even though like that, those movies were self-contained and not part of a cinematic universe, they like, they really defined the tone, like what DC would try to do to contrast itself with Marvel. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, until, until that didn't work well enough for their money, and then they just kind of threw everything at the wall. Um, yeah. Um, and one another thing I just want to bring up very briefly, um, this movie does look very, very good. Um, visually, it like... It looks a lot more like a movie than, like, post-Avengers Marvel Oh, absolutely. Do. Like, I mean, definitely post, like, Avengers Endgame Marvel and you know I I do remember really liking sort of the how colorful like the Avengers is but this is a this is a very colorful movie um it was the cinematographer was Matthew Labatique who uh, is best known for working with Darren Aronofsky he did uh, oh. Requiem for a Dream uh, his uh, early film Pi he did The Fountain um and Black Swan and my personal favorite and I will uh, die on a hill for this movie Mother uh, yes the uh, critically acclaimed I, movie I Mother. That. I, you know, I think the Aronofsky I like most of the ones I've seen is actually The Wrestler. I haven't seen that one, but that is that is I think his I, most. I beloved haven't seen it long one, time. I guess or most uh, maybe the most like universally accessible. It's, like I wouldn't say necessarily for Black Swan because there's a lot of shit in there that could be very off putting to people, but I feel like The Wrestler kind of is his most. I, and again, I haven't seen it, but just from the impression I get, it's it's his m- more accessible. Um, I don't think. Hold on, I don't think he did. He work on the wrestler? No, no. He Matthew Labatique was not the cinematographer for the wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he might have been busy actually on Iron Man. Um, hold on, when was the wrestler? Oh, that would have been around the same time. Yeah, yeah the wrestler was also two thousand eight. So presumably he was busy. Uh, filming Iron Man. Um, oh, there yeah. you go. So, any anyway, big ups to Matthew Labatique. Uh, this movie looks great. It's colorful. Everything doesn't look like wet fucking cement. You can actually see I, what's going on during night scenes, which is so nice. There are sets and costumes and location photography. Everything is not a green screen. Yeah, and and even though sometimes like the, um, so I guess the the um. CG department, at least, I think was either heavily inspired by, like, the Transformers movies, or they they got, like, the same uh, CG effects team to work on, at least the moments where Tony's, like, suiting up in the suit. So I know there's there's some part, parts of it that look kind of janky, but, like, overall, the CG for, effects are it good. Looks, the, 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 CG, the CG looks good for 2000. Yes, um, like, there are... It doesn't... Yeah, there are some parts, like, you know, like, they... Like, it looks like they're superimposing, like, Robert Downey Jr.'s face onto another person in the suit, oh, oh, where yeah. that, you, looks, that you, looks real janky. Um, you can you can tell, but it's like, it's cons- it doesn't have that later thing that started happening, because they're mass producing them. Yeah. Like, a, like an assembly line, where you've got, like, within one movie, because there's, like, eight different special effects houses all just churning out shots, you've got, like, some effect shots that look really good, and then some that just... That that just like look like something out of uh, Buffy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just just like cape, uh, cable, non cable television. Um, also, like the parts where Tony's in the Iron Man suit, like those in perspective shots, is just he looks like he's got a face filter on. It's just it, it look he looks very smooth and very like. Do he he looks like he's got a Snapchat filter on? Um, oh yeah, yeah. He kind of does because they that. They they would reuse that shot for every everywhere Iron Man shows up in in other uh-huh. movies. They still do the in the face mask thing with him. Um, yeah, you're right. He is he is kind of smoothed out there. Yeah. Um, um, and the, yeah. I was going to say the the action scenes do they've got more heft to them than other later movies of this type, but they are still they they have a bit of that like lack of mass. And and force and inertia that a lot of CGI heavy action sequences tend to yeah. have. Yeah, um, I will. S- I will say if if I do have 
a favorite scene in this movie. I would say it's it's definitely the scene where he's testing out the, you know, the flight tech and the flight simulators. Um, like they have that, they sort of show the uh like uh camera footage from like the camera's perspective, and they have he has like this nice uh funny banter with like one of the claw arms, like one of those Boston dynamic fucking things with its uh uh, which which all act like dogs. Which all I act noticed, like dogs. Like pets. Which that's <laughs> and I think like that's that's a high point of any superhero movie is seeing them like testing their powers. Um, like everyone remembers, especially like it, it reminded me very much of like Sam Raimi Spider Man. Um, yeah. So I I got which I think Sam Raimi was attached to maybe being involved in Iron Man. Oh wait, we didn't we didn't mention um sort of like what earlier iterations of iron man that were attempted to be yeah because the there were yeah there were various you know the the license changed hands a few times there were various attempts uh stuart gordon they approached in the early 90s to make like a low budget one which would have been so cool been, that would have been i would have awesome. loved yeah, I, I like stuart gordon um quite a bit yeah and that would have been neat to see uh they approached whedon uh Around the turn, which because he was involved with writing Marvel comics all through the nineties and two thousands. That's true. None of which I've ever read, and I've heard not great things. I, I did. I do like his some of his shows. I, I, they're, I was, they're oh, I liked Buffy when I point. like would watch it. Um, certainly, and again, like I'll have to read. Well, when we revisit the Avengers, we'll see if my feelings have changed. But I did like it. It was the movie that got me on the Marvel train. Um, so hopefully, at least you know hold up somewhat but um i guess yeah at one point i, I think it'll be fine yeah. i think like it'll be actually i think i might be a bit better because i thought i'd like this one even as a marvel movie more than i did and i think it's that if you take out robert downey jr and his chemistry with some of the other cast it's a very and i think you can see it's like they didn't have a proper script yeah it's it's very kind of all it's 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 kind of all over the place the pacing isn't super tight the the themes are outside the 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 character himself's personal sort of redemption like the themes are a bit muddled yeah um yeah and, 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 and like that middle act like that that middle act has some fun moments in it but like the whole thing just kind of flops around until they can put jeff bridges in a bigger iron man yeah. suit and have a fight <laughs> um yeah and also it's just looking at the because again, we're professionals here, so I'm looking at the Wikipedia uh, page for Iron Man 2008 in the development section. Uh, Nick Cage was had expressed uh, interest in being Iron Man, which would have fucking ripped. I think Nick. Uh, that would have been so much more. I think Nick Nick Cage has wanted to be every superhero. Oh, I mean, he he's genuinely named is a huge after Luke Cage. Player. Like he's he's actually. Oh yeah, right. I forgot. Yeah, about I that. mean, he's he's actually a Coppola. You know, yeah. so he. <laughs> Um, and I guess, uh, Tom Cruise also expressed interest in being Iron Man, which I could, I could see as well. And then, um, at one point, Quentin yeah, Tarantino I mean, was approached Sam to kind of... make an Iron Man movie. So kind of everyone's fingers were in this little pot at one point. I, I, I can't imagine Tarantino ever actually being given oh, one God, of these no. movies because he would not make, he would not make it. No audience friendly in no, PG-13 absolutely enough. absolutely not. I just don't think it's in his DNA to do absolutely it. Absolutely not. Um, but it is, I think, interesting to situate this because we've got, um, like, Iron Man was not, I think, that big outside of people who were into the comics. Yeah, they had to do- um, Like, he, he had a cartoon yeah. in the 90s, but I I didn't see it as a kid, really. Yeah, um, they had to- he was, they had to he was do, a second stringer. Yeah, they had to I do, think, like- In the wider- uh, uh, Focus groups beforehand to, like- uh, you know, press back against people's misconceptions of Iron Man. Like Iron Man is not a robot; it is a guy in a yeah, suit. They, they they made what did they call them? Uh, it, it, advertorials, which short animated films oh, yeah. to explain the concept of Iron Man to people that didn't read the comics. Just, um, just, you know, reading before everyone wants to have a signed reading before they watch a movie. <laughs> Which is just weird because I feel like you get even without like I don't you don't need to fucking watch those ad- like everything's very clear like this is say what you will about this movie it's very clear what's going on like it's not hard to follow um, granted this is this is a movie for general audiences well, these you don't are want, like an art these house are before sort of- 
These are before the movie even came out. They're kind of laying the groundwork to even get people to see an Iron Man okay. movie by giving them an idea of what the deal is. Um, Just pulling random fucking people off the street like, hey, you want to see a movie? And yeah. you know what? If it's free, <laughs> they're going to want to see it. Even if it's bad, like that's that's the that's the reason. Like they do, like whenever they do like f- test screenings, they just pull random people off the street, be like, "Hey, free movie." Um, yeah. So now it's it's isn't it quaint to think there once was a time where people were like, "Iron Man, who's that?" It's like, yeah, that's yeah, because he he didn't have the the. F- uh, outside comics footprint like spider-man had the sa- that had even before the sam raimi movies like a few really big cartoons yeah. like the 60s cartoon was big the 90s one um the hulk had the 70s tv show mm-hmm. which was like even if you didn't watch it yourself like you knew it by cultural oh, osmosis of course. um so like spider-man and the hulk and the x-men because the x-men had a big cartoon and, and big movies before this were like Marvel's guys outside the realm of people who read the comics. Um, and it's, it's only now that it seems like, Oh, Iron Man as the kind of centerpiece of the, of the Avengers and all that, like that, that that's, I mean, I did like, like, like to an extent, John Favreau and really Robert Downey Jr. Without him, this movie is probably kind of forgotten. Like a lot of other blockbusters, um, uh, there's no MCU. There's no Iron Man as the centerpiece character holding it together, at least through its like first, through its adolescence. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's really because inc- because usually this stuff doesn't hinge so much on one guy. It's it's actually kind of like a weird somehow like Robert Downey Jr. is the superhero of making these movies. Uh, be- because it's like, and I can't think of any other situation really like this where you take one guy out of one actor even out of their role and the whole thing yeah. not just a movie but a whole multimedia empire implodes oh yeah him. no this there is no doubt in my mind iron man would not have worked without robert downey jr absolutely no doubt in my mind there if if robert downey jr had not been iron man we would not have an mcu I, 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 no, not at all. And I mean, <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe that's what we got. You know, it's like, yeah, so would you go back in time and, and kill Hitler? It's like, no, but I'd, the, I'd go back it's in the time. the domino meme. And I'd talk Robert, I'd talk Robert Downey Jr. into doing a different movie. It's the domino <laughs> meme, the smallest domino. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is a terrible drug, drug addict. And then, like, the biggest domino is like, Disney now owns half of media. Whoops, there goes my Yeah, neck. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but what else? I guess maybe we can sort of move on to. Um, I I think I guess I think if there's one other thing I wanted to touch on, and this extends to this like reflection of liberal, especially American liberal ideology, which is probably going to be my dead horse through this whole podcast. Well, you can um, have a dead horse. Where we're all allowed, we're all horses. allowed one dead horse. It's good meat. Ugh. Um, and <laughs> and it's um. That there's this the idea, and you see that with like the Elon Musk type guys, and the, the super extent idea kind of broadly is like one one guy is the difference between like this technology working and not not like in any historical thing you like you go back in time you kill Albert Einstein somebody else will figure out what he figured out pretty soon yeah. right like it's all a kind of cumulative aggregate of human thought and behavior. Um, But this, this movie rests so hard on the idea that like without Tony Stark, nobody could build this missile or or an arc reactor or anything like, you know? Um, And I mean, like, like you need it for the, for this kind of movie, but it's like, it is another one of those reflections of, of ideology, right? The, the exceptional individual, the, the, the man who can do this, the, the man who can, who can only be trusted to wield the power of the Iron Man suit. And then, that's reflected in America, the 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 exceptional empire, yeah. the one the one nation, by virtue of its wonderful democratic traditions, blah blah blah, all that mythology that 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 can responsibly rule the world, yeah. not um, not China, not Russia, nobody else can do it, and just us. That actually perfectly sort of before we move on, um, there's another 
a sort of expert from uh, Aiden Bryant's uh, analysis of Iron Man that I wanted to read um, that actually perfectly encapsulates sort of what you just said there, Stu. Um, So Bryant writes, another important consideration is that the superhero tradition originated in the United States, and because of its original social function, superheroes are inherently advocates and protectors of truth, justice, and the American way. Of course, promoting the cultural beliefs of one nation for the benefit of the audience within that nation is not necessarily harmful. Nationalism is a uniting and often beneficial phenomenon, Eh. and comics have been historically instrumental in keeping American morale high during wartime. True. What is harmful, however, is the promotion of the American way at, at the disparagement of other cultures. This is where American hegemony and American exceptionalism come into play. This fo- this form of hegemony goes far beyond Orientalism, even casting aspirations on the European way or the Japanese way. These nations are American allies, and yet American media still find a way to other them and assert complete and unquestionable dominance in the global setting. So it's it's not it's not enough that you know it has to be Tony Stark because you know he's a he's a incredibly charming you know engineer wealthy wealthy engineering genius. He has to like it's because he's also an American. Um, like we, yeah. you would not get like, you know, who's the 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 Russian Iron Man? That's a villain, basically. You get any any other sort of person on, and again, like the the, the, ten the rings, Winter Soldier, the the Russian Captain America. Although, is although a villain. again, we'll 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 talk about Winter Soldier until he's redeemed and that, becomes but, American. I yeah. Guess, yeah. Um, but yeah, that is it's, there is a lot of very noxious um, political and um, imperialist stuff here that I don't think we as Americans were really ready to look into with a critical eye in two thousand eight. Um, and now I think it just it comes off all the worse now that we've literally just pulled out of Afghanistan this year, and um, just it's it's kind of darkly funny in retrospect thinking because the the big line of uh, against pulling out of Afghanistan or you know against it was like oh all the weapons we're leaving behind, and now I'm just thinking of fucking like we've just left a bunch of fucking like non functioning Iron Man suits. Like in Afghanistan or something, just just Stark Industries shit. Um, but I mean, my my overall take would be this is definitely a watchable movie. Um, it's a it's a good it's- popcorn movie. It's a good popcorn movie, but it's you just I just can't you just can't really watch anything that is so enmeshed in sort of the cultural and political. Uh, Nest that is the war on terror, and come out of this thinking like you know anything other than oh Jesus Christ, our this is you know our our again our big takeaway from this movie isn't uh isn't you know you know we shouldn't be building or selling weapons. It's that we shouldn't be building weapons and selling them unless we have you know good accountability and make sure they don't fall into the wrong hands, you know, but yeah. not, but oh, in and, our and hands, they're fine. And, and that's the thing. It's like, he says, oh, well, Stark Industries won't build weapons anymore, but then he builds a weapon just for himself to yes, use because he's yeah. so trustworthy and, and, and responsible and, and uniquely geniusly equipped to, to do it. And I think like, I think with this movie, like I'm, I'm one of those people's like, I think it's, it's great to po- deconstruct the politics of movies because they're like mirrors. Yes. And that's what I, what I feel like with them because Marvel is so hegemonic now. That's what makes it like a great big mirror. Um, and then attempts to copy its formula are interesting in terms of how they failed to be or what have you. Um, but I think a lot of the times, like even like, I mean, there's the all sorts of ways the defense uh, department, the defense industry, uh, intelligence are enmeshed in Hollywood production, uh, including Iron I think Man. Broadly, including Iron Man, they oh, were absolutely. production assistants. Because um, I did, I didn't look over billions of dollars of. Yeah, I sent you that article. Production value. Uh, it's from Spy Culture called Pentagon Production Assistance Agreements for Iron Man One and Two. 
Um, I didn't actually look through the um, production assistant agreement document um, because I would have had to download it and I was too lazy. Uh, yeah, take that as you will. But yeah, this um, just from the very first movie, the Department of Defense had their nasty little fingers all over sort of Marvel movies. Um, but yeah. What I found interesting is it was some of the stuff is how like the things the defense department actually like tries to interfere with are like really pedantic. Like where does shield fit in the defense? Yeah. We don't I read like that. the shield stuff. Cause we don't know where they fit or in like, the, we don't in like the, that in the Pentagon line. hierarchy. <laughs> As opposed yeah. to like but, the fact that Tony Stark is able to like during that dog fight scene, he just stops shorts and breaks a fucking jet. Like, yeah. and not to mention the jet, like, also the guy's parachute won't launch. So, and how much money, presume, how many, how many, how much money in tax dollars you think went into building that they, fucking they, broken they, ship? I, there's like a little readout that says it's like an $84 million jet. No, an F-22 is like double. Okay. That. Like, th- those are like $180 million or okay. something. I mean, Defense Department acquisition budgets are actually really hard to really accurately yeah. assess because it's all a grift. But that, that's actually another thing I did want to touch on is like they talk about, oh, the, the if what, like the, the 10 rings leader guy says, oh, if, if I had eight of these Iron Man suits, I could rule all of Asia. Yeah. It's like, no, like, like these billion dollar wonder waffen aren't what win wars. Uh, they're, they're, they're a grift to make the defense industry rich. What's winning wars right now is that I mean technology does matter, but what's winning wars right now is the stuff that's cheaply mass produced. It's 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 cell phones with GPS, and it's 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 the kind of drones that you can get. At, uh, well, Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore, but like it's the, that you can <laughs> Circuit, order off Circuit Amazon City, for a few no, hundred wait. bucks. Like that that is the stuff that is winning like wars. Yeah. Like that's that's what like the that's the reason. Uh, the 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 Houthis in in Yemen have been, I mean, at a terrible human cost, but have been largely kicking Saudi Arabia's ass, despite Saudi Arabia having the fourth best funded yeah. military in the world. Yeah, um, they like Saudi Arabia has the Iron Man stuff, yes. and they're losing horribly to guys who are who are in in one of the poorest parts of the world, and they've got AK forty sevens, they've got those really cheap bootleg cell phones you get at a flea market and they've got drones you order off Amazon that they strap bombs to. Yeah. And and that's the stuff. I mean, that's outside that framework uh, that like, that's the thing. I think all, most of the ideology here is unquestioned. Oh, absolutely. A lot of it. Like, yeah, I don't, not questioned. Like the, the closest thing it ever comes to questioning it is, is the uh, Vanity Fair lady. Who, uh, you know, her first interaction with Tony, war criminal, she starts like chewing him out for, yeah, she starts chewing him out for, you know, being pl- complicit in, you know, the military industrial complex and selling weapons. You know, he gives her one charming line and he fucks her. And for the rest of the movie, yeah, she's she just kind of like in to- there to like, you know, throw out, be like, you know, well, which it comes across, she's like not so much like, after sort of her hookup with Tony, she's not so much, you know, trying to follow up with him as a journalist as she is just like mad he didn't call her, which is, oh boy. Um, that's, I mean, that's one of those things that like I wouldn't, uh, like, yes, but also I feel like a lot of access journalists are very pro- like self involved. Oh man. Do you think, oh, she, she would, that lady would definitely be a blue check mark now, though. Oh, absolutely. Oh, she's yeah. Oh, she's she 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 she'd just be talking about the 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 toxic men in her mentions because after writing a piece on Tony Stark's arms dealership, she arms dealing, she like turned around and wrote about how we need to bomb Libya a few yeah. years later. And then everybody would point it out the hypocrisy and 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 she was just like toxic men just don't yeah. like a woman in journalism. Um okay, well, I think we've reached the point in our discussion where we should probably make a recommendation for uh a better movie yeah to yeah watch. so uh i, I yeah, and that, i wonder if concludes... we have the same recommendation um obviously so yes yeah, so that that concludes uh iron man i think we kind of got out and i mean we can all like there'll be recurring themes we can revisit in other episodes too if we 
so to speak, missed anything with this specific one, I think. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to uh, kind of wind down the show by just talking about if, if you want something kind of like this or that scratches an itch or that intersects with the theme, its themes or aesthetics, what else could you watch? All right. So I, I'm, I guess I'll say mine first and hold on. I'll, actually, I'll be right back because someone is rudely ringing my doorbell. Hold on. Oh, how there. Oh, wait, never mind. Nope, one of my roommates has got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to say RoboCop. Me too. Yeah, I knew it. I fucking knew it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> RoboCop because, like, A, that is a movie that actually spends time, you know, maybe not outright, like, on the nose, but does really criticize sort of the weapons industry and even, you know, like, the policing industry itself. And B, um, at least according to IMDb, there are like several allusions to RoboCop in Iron Man. Um, yeah, Favreau cited RoboCop, uh, Tom Clancy, and James Bond. He kind of saw this as an yeah. espionage action thriller. Yeah, apparently. Um, he, yep. It. Uh, yeah, there's a reference to RoboCop in the free fall fight scene, um, and there is also a reference to RoboCop two, uh, which I have not seen. Me neither. Um, I've never seen the sequel. Why? Why? Why would I want to see a sequel to like a literal perfect movie? Um, yeah, there's a reference to Iron Man two during the big uh, Obadiah Stane fight. Which also, what kind of fucking name is Obadiah? That's like, uh, like, oh my 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 dung cousin Jebediah dung got bit by a copperhead or or something. Like, what kind of fucking is Obadiah Stane like an actual character from the comics? Because he's not like in what. What care is what character is like at least Obadiah seen at like the end in the fucking gorilla suit supposed to be? Um, cause I don't I don't think he's actually supposed to because I guess originally it, the villain was supposed to be the Mandarin. Of course, that got pushed back to the third movie, and we we all know what happened with that. Um, I thought that was the second. One. No, that's uh Mandarin's in Iron Man 3. Is it, it is Iron, Iron Man, Man 3. 3. Okay. It's, it's been I haven't gone back to, to either of those. Oh, since Iron they, Monger. They came out. Okay. Obadiah Stane is yeah. Iron Monger in the comics. Okay. I think he does he does say something. There there is some throwaway line about mongering something <laughs> in reference to okay. him in that big suit. Um okay. Oh, here we go. Thank you, those Google sidebars. Um, first appearance, Iron Man number 163, October 1982. Iron Monger uh, as the, the villain first appears in Iron Man number 200, November 1985. Cool. Um, but yeah, uh, Ir- uh, not Iron Man, RoboCop is fucking amazing and a literal perfect movie. And I'm not just saying that because I really love Paul Verhoeven's movies, Um Showgirls is my favorite. We stand Showgirls. This is a this is a pro Showgirls podcast, and I'm putting my foot down right now. But uh, RoboCop is. I have is, actually. You've never, I've seen, never Showgirls? seen Showgirls or Basic Instinct. <gasps> oh my god! Oh honey. I mean, I love RoboCop. I love a Total Recall. Is actually like I grew up with that on VHS from like being a baby because my parents basically didn't censor my media intake oh, all. Oh, so it's yeah. like this super violent movie with people's eyes bulging out of their heads relate. and women with like relate. three tits out and I'm like I'm like three years old watching Yeah, yeah. My my dad like had me and my sister watching like Godzilla movies by the time we were like five. I think we watched like Terminator two when I was maybe like seven or some shit. So I can definitely Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I saw I saw that movie like f- I don't like, like I saw that movie before I could talk. I'm pretty sure for the yeah. first time. Like I, I saw that. Um, but yeah, RoboCop is excellent. It's far sharp. Like this movie doesn't really have a social satire. It just kind of gestures at issues it, to it cover just, its it ass. It doesn't so much um, as gesture as just kind of like shrug at them. Even yeah, yeah. That 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 would be the pr- exactly. And RoboCop is much sharper. Um. Oh, it is so and it's, sharp. It's 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 satire. Hold on, let me um, let me read because I rewatched RoboCop this past January. Um, 
and I, I just just to promote my um my own sort of shit, I just want to read briefly my letterbox review from my last uh Robocop rewatch, um, which was January 9th, 2021. Uh, in the wake of this past summer's oh, yeah. BLM protests and last week's attempted siege of the Capitol by Trump extremists, the Biden-Harris co- administration, in cooperation with OCP Corporation, is pleased to announce a revolutionary new criminal justice program that will ensure more public accountability for law enforcement. If that doesn't, if that, listeners, if that doesn't sell you on this movie, <laughs> uh, I I don't know what to tell you, uh, uh, Red from and, that 70s show, isn't it? And he's movie. the bad guy. Oh, Kurtwood Kurt Smith. Kurt yeah, he's, Smith. I mean, this is this is like so good. An, an all-timer performance oh, he's, from he's him. He's so fucking good in this. Uh, guns, guns, guns. Also, Miguel guns. Ferrer, the great Miguel Ferrer. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's in this. Uh, Ray And Ray Wise. We got two Twin Peaks people. Oh, yeah, we there. got Ray Wise. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Stacked cast, great action, all that wonderful 80s, giant squibs, practical effects. A guy uh, melts. Giant stop motion. A guy motion, fucking melts. Neck. Yeah. It explodes and when it, you sit by a car. Yes. Yes. What more do you want in a fucking movie? There's no exploding people in Iron Man. Mar- and Marvel will not give you a disgusting exploding man in your movies. No, no. They will They, they will not give you giant um, bloody squibs either. Um, you know what? Uh Eternals, not the first sex scene in a Marvel movie. Iron Man has a sex scene. Do, that's you, I, true. I will say that Tony Stark's horny. Tony Stark's yeah, horny. Yeah, that's in like this. his. That's the in, first in a way nobody else. Fifteen in minutes. Marvel is Tony Stark fucks people. Tony Stark fucks. Yeah, and and John Favreau wants you to know that he Tony Stark is a man whore, and you know what? He's proud of it, and I can't say I'm not disappointed in him. If I if I were Robert Downey Jr., like. Like, talk about Delph. He's still a Delph. Um, but yeah, if I were Tony Stark or Robert Downey Jr., I would just be fucking and sucking and just not giving a shit. Uh, but uh, so. Oh, yeah. Ima- imagine if if I had that natural charisma and good looks. I, I, I would be just, just, just on some unreal, obscene shit yeah um but sadly we are not no one should have that thing no one should have that power yeah um no one should have an iron man suit no one should be that sexy (laughs) yeah with great with great power comes great responsibility (laughs) yeah um and i did have oh i did have one other recommendation Ooh, what is it um if you're if you're interested in like uh if you're grabbed at all by like the morally questionable Daddy issues, son of a genius inventor, uh, or superhero stuff in general, super science stuff in general. Uh, the Venture Brothers okay. is a great show. Yeah. It's what it, every other adult animated sitcom has been chasing its shadow for years. Um, it incorporate like like it's obviously guys that made it or like into the it, it's its main thing is kind of like a pastiche of Johnny Quest yeah. and John. Yeah. Uh, Tom Swift, but it also incorporates a lot of like comic book stuff pretty quickly. And it's parody. It's, it's sort of reinterpretation of it and parody of it. It's XBs are all so much sharper than anything that came later after the, the Marvel boom and tried to like, uh, uh, skewer it, even like the boys or something like great, great show. Um, wish, Adult Swim would give it like a, a season, a, another season to close out. One of one of the greats, one one of the greats in animated sitcoms, uh, or 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 dark comedy in general. Uh, awesome show, stacked voice cast, very funny, very even. I don't know if poignant is the right word, but it's like it's like it's always sunny, where it's yeah. like at its best, where where it's it's funny. And it's not didactic, but like the comedy is rooted in a pathos of like real solid characterization. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I only I've only ever watched like a couple episodes of the Venture Brothers, like years and years ago, at least more than probably five years ago. So I can't um, I can't really give an informed opinion. So my recommendation is going to be solidly RoboCop. Um, please. 
please, I'm on your my knees begging you, please watch RoboCop. No, you cannot is, get, you can no longer any- get the Criterion edition of RoboCop. I think those are long out of print, but uh, if it ever comes oh, back, you, you can get them. Um- Please just watch RoboCop. If, if any, if any, DM me. I will, I will be able to point you in the direction of getting that Criterion RoboCop. If you know what I mean. Um, is there? Yeah. You think anyone's listening hasn't seen RoboCop? I mean, maybe um, there's a generation fr- gap maybe there. Maybe my I, friends. I, maybe some of my friends that I'm gonna goad into listening to. Um, maybe my friends because I do. I do have a friends who are quite into Marvel. Um, so I, I should. I, I know at least one who I think I, I should really press into seeing RoboCop if he hasn't already. But I, yeah, if if you haven't seen RoboCop, what's wrong with you? Please RoboCop stop what you're doing and watch with, RoboCop. And Starship Troopers by the same and Starship and Troopers part. So yeah, they, I, they, I, they I can't wait for neatly. his new movie too. I'm gonna review it for the website as well. Uh, I've already claimed oh yeah, it. I need to I need to watch Black Book and Benedetta. Two. Well, Benedetta, Benedetta, I'm going to be reviewing for the website. Um, oh, awesome. Uh, art, the Arts Views, uh, Boston's local arts uh, music movie uh, review site. Uh, yeah, I will be when whenever that becomes accessible because I probably won't be able to get a screener. I feel like that's kind of too big of a movie to get like a screener to. Like, I, I was just able to like hit up uh, Utopia to get a screener for Dasha's movie, and they were like, here, have it. I was like, thanks. Like, it was literally a Vimeo link. So I don't think I'd be able to do that with Benedetta. But um, yeah, L by Paul Verhoeven uh, is is really fucking great. Uh, instead of Promising Young Woman, watch L. Just, you know what? Besides anything, just watch Paul Verhoeven movies. Paul Verhoeven is a gift. Um, and I am, he's, I'm so he's glad he has a new movie great. coming out. In, in all in all timer, a... a- a, a Dutch, it's someone who is both an athe, a Dutchman, and someone who is both an atheist yet also a respected Jesus scholar. Yeah, yeah. The man. The in man addition is to making so like brilliant. movies like RoboCop, the man <laughs> is not just RoboCop. Also, um, just before we close out, uh, it's it's kind of hard to access. I the only time I was able to watch it was a YouTube, uh, vid- like a YouTube link of questionable. Uh, visual quality but uh his early movie called the fourth man is really good it's very like noirish um best known for there is a scene where a guy confronts his uh like lover's other male lover in (laughs) in a crypt where she's keeping all like the dead uh like burnt up or like the, the urns of her previous dead partners and then he just starts sucking this guy's dick. It's awesome. Oh hell yeah! It's awesome. I love you. Yeah, Paul I've got to watch his his pre Hollywood stuff too. I've got yeah. Uh, I've got that's flesh that's and a pre Hollywood. That's the fourth man is uh, Dutch, so that's that's pre Hollywood. Do you do you need to see uh, men's uh, first through third in order to make sense of that one? No, but it helps. <laughs> um, I think that about wraps it up was there anything else you wanted to add or or anything you wanted to promote uh follow me on uh twitter and letterbox i'm at kunsaragi which yeah it's like maxado katsuragi but cunt with a k yeah that's the whole thing um yeah beyond i write movie reviews for the arts views um depending on sort of when this comes out right as of right now my newest review is for uh uh, Scary of Sixty First Street by Dasha Nekrasova, which is um, Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, uh, yeah, the uh, put it put it on maybe, for your family. Uh, maybe put a future bonus episode for your friends. Sorry, maybe if maybe a future bonus. Maybe a episode, future. Oh my god, I would. You know what? Not not a good movie, but I would I would rewatch that over Iron Man. Probably, yeah, yeah. It's 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 um, it's 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 a type of movie. It's a it's a movie. So, so bad, so so bad. It's good isn't really the it's, right term for it. It's, it's like it's literally it's, it's literally not, Freddy got fingered for not, girls who shop at Brandy Melville, and have been online. There you too go. Much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It's I think you said in your review like you'll 
you, you might not think it's good, but you'll remember watching and you it. You know what? I haven't stopped more than you about can it. say for so many movies. I haven't stopped. Thinking oh yeah, that about was it. that one was on my brain for for Jesus. weeks after, just trying to be like, what? What were you going for? What is happening? <laughs> So so many. It's it's a collection of just intriguingly baffling creative decisions and and, and wild the kind of wildly singular self indulgence that you never see in a big budget trolling. Movie there's too many troll. people. Yeah. Um, and and Stu, do you have anything to plug for yourself? Um, I've I've got a Twitter discourse Stu. Um, I I publish once in a blue moon a, a short story. Or or an essay here or there on a Substack. I, I might just include a link in the description for your convenience. Um, but that's 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 uh, really about it. Um, mostly just thank you for listening. Please, if if you're enjoying yourself, uh, give likes and reviews on the appropriate platforms. That that always is a thing you're supposed to say. Um, and uh, tune in uh, yeah. next time. I had a lot of fun doing this. I definitely I, too. I think we're gonna do this again. So. Yeah. I guess stay doing roughly chronologically uh, Incredible Hulk or Dark Knight would be up on yeah. deck. Yeah. Um, and if you have anything mean to say or any criticisms, fuck off. Um, just, just kidding. We yeah, love please, our please listeners. Please direct all hostility. Please direct all hostility exclusively through me. Yeah. No, don't yell at me. Uh, I will cry. I will cry. <laughs> um, okay. I'm I'm also fragile, but I refuse to acknowledge it publicly. All right. Well, until next time, Stu. Yeah. Uh, until next time. Uh, All right. Sayonara. <laughs> <laughs>